morning, good afternoon, and welcome everyone to today's webinar, Spirituality in Serious Illness and Health, Becoming Familiar with this Important New Systematic Review from JAMA. I'm Andrew Andresco, Project Coordinator for Transforming Chaplaincy, and we are all delighted you could join us. Some housekeeping instructions off the top. You are listening in using your computer speaker system by default and are muted. Should you have any technical questions regarding your audio or visual, please type those into the chat box located into the, in the platform's dashboard. Um, and with that, I'd like to introduce Dr. George Pachet, Director of Transforming Chaplaincy. Thanks, Andy. Uh, friends, welcome to everybody. So glad you can join us for this important webinar. Um, six weeks ago, JAMA published the paper, Spirituality in Serious Illness and Health. It's arguably the most important publication on this topic in the past 20 years. We've organized today's webinar to help you become familiar with the key findings in the paper and the rigorous methods that support them. And we also hope to give you some ideas for how you can use this information to strengthen the integration of spiritual care in your healthcare organization. To do this, I'm very excited to introduce today's speakers. Andy, you wanna show us the next slide? Yeah. They are three colleagues with whom I've had the pleasure of working on various projects, and I'm really uh, very grateful for each of them uh, to uh, join us today uh, and help us uh, with this webinar. The lead author uh, on this paper is Tracy Balboni. Many chaplains will know Tracy from the work she's been doing with her colleagues over the years uh, on uh, issues of spirituality and religion for patients with serious illness. Tracy's a senior physician at the Dana Farber Brigham and Women's Cancer Center, and she's professor of radiation oncology at Harvard Medical School. Tracy, so glad to have you with us. Um, as one of the respondents to the paper, discussing the paper with us, uh, we've invited Tammy Quest. Tammy is the Montgomery Chair in Palliative Medicine and Professor in Chief of the Division of Palliative Medicine in the Department of Family and Preventive Medicine and also Professor in the Department of Emergency Medicine at Emory University School of Medicine. Tammy is the Director of the Emory Palliative Care Center in the Emory Woodruff Health Sciences Center. And among other things, Tammy is the past president of the American Academy of Hospice and Palliative Medicine. Tammy, so grateful to have you with us. Um, and in addition, Antonina Olszewski is with us. Antonina is the vice president of spiritual care in the Division of Mission Integration for Ascension and uh, been a strong partner for Transforming Chaplaincy and really grateful that you can join us as well, Antonina. I think this conversation is going to take up most of the hour, so we're not planning on having any Q&A time um, for today's presentation, but we're open to uh, thinking about ways in which uh, we might plan additional webinars around this important paper, so uh, send us your thoughts about that and, and we might uh, look for other opportunities. In this slide, you'll see um, uh, a link to uh, the paper at JAMA. If you haven't linked to it and haven't downloaded it, you can get to, to JAMA and through your institution's account to JAMA, uh, you can download it or you can uh, um, uh, privately enroll in JAMA and uh, request a copy. Uh, there have been two commentaries by chaplains uh, uh, about the paper. I wrote a commentary about the paper in the August newsletter uh, for Transforming Chaplaincy, and you'll see the link to that there. And many of you know John Eamon's wonderful work in the ACB Research Network, and John uh, featured this paper in the article of the month for uh, his August newsletter. And so the link to John's commentary is also there. Tracy, I'm about to <coughs> excuse me, turn this over to you, uh, and just wanna let people know uh, that Tracy's slides will be made available. Uh, Tracy, thanks. Uh, go ahead. Wonderful. Thank you so much, George, for the kind introduction and um, really looking forward to this hour together. Um, I think, Andy, I think you may need to stop sharing your slides so I can go ahead and share my slides. Great. Okay, so um, as uh, George just mentioned, I'm, I'm, uh, can you all hear, George, can you see my screen okay? 
I can. Um, uh, you're not in presentation mode yet, so um, it'll make it. A, there you go. That's great. There, go. Now it is. Okay, great. Perfect. Perfect. Yeah. Um, great. Thank you. So, uh, so it's really a, a, a pleasure to have this opportunity to present uh, this JAMA special communication um, report. I'm, I'm, I'm reporting out on it on behalf of a very large team um, of just wonderful colleagues, in, including George, who's here with us, as well as many others. And, uh, and what I'm gonna be attempting to do is providing you with just an overview of the special communication report, um, its methods, um, and in particular, focusing in on the, the uh, uh, sort of the methods and, and results pertaining to, spirit, uh, to serious illness, spirituality and serious illness. Um, we're hoping that perhaps at another time we can zero in on uh, the results as far as spirituality in um, and health outcomes, so in particular among healthy populations. And um, it's really wonderful to have this um, opportunity for Tammy and Antonina to then interact with um, these findings, particularly as, as um, we're thinking about the implications for um, the practice of spiritual care within medicine. So first we'll start with our uh, background and methods. So of course, importantly, you know, why did we bother to do this project? Um, what, what issue are we addressing? And as um, you all likely are very well aware, there's uh, growing research in spirituality, um, in illness, as well as in health. Um, and, but it, it really has had a limited impact on healthcare. It's had some, uh, but um, one would argue less than the actual volume of literature pertaining to these topics. Um, often because of issues such as it doesn't get into high impact journals. Um, and, um, and I would also say that there's been some general bias uh, about including spirituality as a component of health. Health that's definitely improving. I think it's getting better, but we still have a ways to go uh, in um, sort of understanding that, that health in its holistic sort of conception includes the spiritual. Um, there's been some evidences of that, though. So, for example, um, I think even intimated a bit in the 1948 WHO definition of health, which um, you're likely familiar with, where it's health is not just the absence of disease or infirmity, but it's a state of complete physical, mental, and social well-being. It doesn't say the spiritual here, um, but um, but certainly there's you could see the evolution toward an understanding of the importance of the spiritual as part of a holistic of, of um, approach to health as illustrated um, in the 2002 WHO definition of palliative care. So in light of the, you know, quite a bit of wonderful research and a limited impact on the practice of medicine, um, our project goal was to provide a real, a comprehensive assessment of the literature on spirituality and health um, within ill and healthy populations. Um, and then name the implications of that literature for medicine by experts in medicine, public health, uh, health policy, et cetera, uh, as well as by religious, religious and spiritual community leaders. Uh, the project uh, methods were um, quite in depth. I'm gonna you know, hope to provide a good general overview for you here. It, um, the, the whole project took well over two years to complete and it began um, with a one-year process of systematic reviews to summarize the strongest evidence available, um, both in spirituality and serious illness and in spirituality in, um, in health outcomes or in healthy populations. Um, we then um, assembled a Delphi panel and presented to them uh, the, uh, the strongest available evidence. I'll, in a moment, I'll take you through more details in how we did the systematic review and how we Kind of sifted out the the strongest available evidence um, in uh, in serious illness and in health, uh, and then asked them to review that summarized evidence in order to provide um, it, a qualitative sort of assessment of what are the main evidence findings, as well as what are the main uh, implications of that evidence for healthcare. So that was about a two month uh, process of that Delphi panel overview. It was an additional two month process for the research team to then analyze that qualitative panel feedback and then sort of digesting it through a qualitative analysis, coming up with, with evidence statements um, supported by the expert panel review, again, both in, in serious illness and in 
uh, and in health outcomes. We then assembled the Delphi panel again, uh, now with revisions to our, uh, our um, uh, summarized literature in, and as well as the um, evidence statements that were the synthesized evidence statements from the Delphi panel review for them to now quantitatively assess the strength of each of those evidence statements, which I'll show you, I'll be showing you later. Um, and then uh, for the um, implications for healthcare, again, digested from the expert panel review, we had them rank the um, implications for healthcare of that evidence in order of importance. And that was also a two month process. And then a final two month process <clears throat> of then analyzing the Delphi panel quantitative data in order to identify what are the evidence statements that this expert Delphi panel believes and agrees are supported by strong evidence. Um, and then what are our Delphi panelists' top three implications of that evidence for the practice of healthcare? So that's a general overview of the methodologic procedure. And there are ways that this kind of gets refined out for spirituality and serious illness and then also spirituality and health outcomes. And uh, I just refer you to the methods on the paper. I won't spend a lot of time going into the nitty gritty on each one here, but they basically each, each um, you know, serious illness and health outcomes followed a similar procedure. I'm gonna take a step back and just share with you a little bit more about the systematic literature review. So we collected the data from multiple um, uh, databases, including PubMed, PsycInfo, et cetera, um, and then did uh, two extractions of, um, of uh, possible literature um, initially from 2000 to 2020, so over a 20 year period. Um, and then there was an update uh, from 2020 to 2022. Two independent reviewers screened each of the abstracts and where needed the full text review in order to determine whether the papers met our inclusion criteria, um, which I'll be going over with you in a moment. Again, we're aiming for kind of strong evidence um, to be informing this whole process. Um, and our inclusion criteria, both in serious illness and in health outcomes reflected that. So two independent reviewers um, assessed whether they believed it met those inclusion criteria. If there was disagreement, it was arbitrated by a, by a third reviewer. If there was agreement uh, that, the, uh, that the manuscript, the study should be included, it was then extracted. There was a primary extractor um, who initially, um, based on you know, certain um, key pieces of evidence, which we extracted out of every single, um, each paper, um, and then a subsequent reviewer who then um, confirmed all of the data extraction and made adjustments and where there was disagreement, it was again arbitrated by a third reviewer or even team review where needed. Finally, uh, once we had all of our data, and extracted all the key pieces of information from those data. Um, we created data tables, um, as well as uh, summaries of the data uh, tables, um, which then the Delphi panelists were able to review and then actually provided further feedback for us to have another iteration of refining our data tables and summaries. So I just wanna to mention to you the article inclusion criteria. This isn't all of them, but this is the main ones pertinent to spirituality and serious illness um, studies. They had to be prospective or cross-sectional descriptive studies, um, meta-analyses that weren't otherwise included uh, and randomized trials that had 100 or more patients and they had to be using validated measures of spirituality. Uh, and then we used fairly similar criteria for health um, outcomes, though requiring a much larger, a thousand or more patients per trial, given uh, that these are, are large cohort studies where we're looking at associations with health, health outcomes. So this is the PRISMA diagram of the systematic review in serious illness. Uh, you can see uh, that the initial um, review was from January 2000 um, through April 2020, a total of over 13,000 uh, manuscripts were reviewed. Um, ultimately, after we sifted through all of them and they, it, those that met those inclusion criteria, as well as um, not uh, having any of our exclusion criteria, um, 
equaled 371. We did do an updated review uh, just to bring it all the way to, to May of this year, and that added an additional 70 papers. And there was a very similar process. I'm just showing it to you here, but won't go into the details um, for spirituality and health outcomes. Once we had all of the, uh, the, the papers extracted, we had two independent reviewers consider the bias, the, um, the amount of bias possible in the study using the Cochrane uh, bias rating criteria. Um, the Cochrane bias rating criteria um, rate the risk of bias as low, moderate, serious, or critical. Um, keep in mind that actually most systematic reviews use low, moderate, and serious as part of their kind of in order to create uh, clinical guidelines. We decided to be on the side of being conservative. We would only use the low to moderate risk of bias studies. Uh, and um, so in, in this case, so all of the studies synthesized, et cetera, those used by our Delphi panelists were the low to moderate risk of bias studies. So they, to be low, they had to be multi-institutional, using validated scales, having a high response rate, um, having strong analytic methods for cross-sectional data, um, providing us with descriptive information or um, and strong analytic methods for prospective data as well. And then moderate, were those that uh, where the criteria for low were largely met apart from one criteria or partially meeting two criteria. And again, a very similar process for our health outcomes papers. So these are our Delphi panelists. We had um, wonderful, a wonderful group of 28 Delphi panelists, so 15 in public health, 13 in serious illness, um, representing a variety of uh, um, of different uh, expertise backgrounds. I'll just you know point out for serious illness, we had um, we had physicians, nurses. Uh, we also had chaplains um, and uh, individuals with experience in um, psychology as well as um, uh, biomedical ethics. Um, we also really tried to have a, a variety between our public health and serious illness participants, sort of representing a variety of different. Um, spiritual backgrounds. That wasn't a primary criteria. The primary criteria was really their expertise, academic expertise backgrounds. Um, but um, uh, we were able to have, um, a, a, I think, a lot of uh, diversity um, in the various uh, sort of spiritual backgrounds represented. So these were the steps that our Delphi uh, panelists went through. I already kind of walked you through the systematic review of the literature. Uh, and so then we, we assembled um, uh, our, our Delphi panel in March of, of 2020 um, for our project overview and orientation. Um, we, they then took those, remember we now have created these evidence tables uh, and summaries and they reviewed those over a two month period, provided qualitative feedback um, on the evidence tables and summaries um, as well as providing qualitative syntheses of, um, of the evidence that they are seeing. We then uh, uh, went through and assessed that um, qualitative feedback given to us by our Delphi panelists. And then ultimately there was a representation of our now revised data tables and summaries, a presentation of the, uh, of the evidence statements and implications to our panelists. And then our panelists provided quantitative ratings of the evidence statement, statements and rankings of the implications of um, that evidence for uh, the practice of medicine. Uh, I just, do just wanna know we did provide the Delphi uh, panelists with project definitions. They're um, listed here. This is a box from the actual paper that the, the um, you know, the central uh, definition was that of spirituality, which is the International Consensus Conference on Spiritual Care Definition of Spirituality. Um, and then uh, related kind of accepted definitions of religion, spiritual needs, and spiritual care. So next is our um, results. In spirituality and serious illness, we noted kind of that there, the, the literature fell under five topic areas, and they're noted here in this table from uh, the paper. Um, first was the role of spirituality in serious illness, then spiritual needs in, spir in serious illness, spiritual care in serious illness, spirituality and patient medical decision-making, 
in spiritual interventions in, in, uh, in serious illness. Next, you can see here, we're indicating how many were that low to moderate risk of bias, so therefore informing uh, the evidence uh, statements and implications in each of the categories, um, what regions of the world that they covered and the numbers of studies in each, um, the sample sizes, as well as the um, interquartile ranges, the measures that were used, and then ultimately the summary of um, the literature pertaining to each of those topic areas. There are also five topic areas in health outcomes. I'm not going to spend much time on these, but just to note that the main, the five topic areas um, were in all-cause mortality, so spirituality and its influences on all-cause mortality, physical health, health behaviors, mental health, and quality of life. So I mentioned to you that what our Delphi panelists did is they reviewed the evidence and then indicated what they saw in the evidence as far as the key findings. Those key findings were then qualitatively analyzed. And, uh, and then what we found from our Delphi panelists were there were 12 kind of evidence, key evidence statements that they were noting or evidence that they were seeing um, in the spirituality and serious illness literature. We then asked them, once we uh, sort of qualitatively devised these evidence statements, to rate each evidence statement and the strength of the evidence behind that statement, from inconclusive to weak to, to strong evidence. And uh, so um, you can see here, religion and our spirituality are important for most patients with serious illness. Um, over here, we see both the medians and means um, and if a evidence statement had a mean and median that was within the strong evidence category, and there was, this is IPRAS is a, is a, um, a quantitative way of assessing rater agreement, and there was agreement by our panel, then that was considered to have met our criteria that it's considered to be strong by our Delphi panel, the evidence statement, and there's agreement that it's strong. And in fact, eight of our statements met those criteria where they were deemed as uh, supported by strong evidence and there was agreement by our panel. These are those eight, I'll just um, uh, run through them with you. So religion and spirituality are important for most patients with serious illness. Um, it, spiritual needs are common uh, and spiritual care within medical care is frequently desired by seriously ill patients. Spiritual needs are frequently unaddressed within medical care. Religion, spirituality can play a, a role in medical decision-making. Spiritual care is infrequent in the medical care of patients with serious illness. Provision of spiritual care to patients with serious illness is associated with better end-of-life outcomes. And then unaddressed spiritual needs are associated with poor patient quality of life outcomes. So those were the eight where our deaf eye panelists um, rated it as supported by strong evidence, and they agreed that it was uh, supported by strong evidence. I'm not going to go through, there were actually 28, there's much more diverse literature on spirituality and health outcomes. There were 28 evidence statements. Um, here again, eight were actually um, rated as supported by strong evidence, and there was agreement, but we'll leave that for another time for discussion of the spirituality and the health outcomes work. These were the um, eight health outcomes findings that were deemed supported by strong evidence by the panelists and where there was agreement. So finally, um, our, our Delphi panelists um, went after they named what they saw as the key evidence um, based on the literature review, um, that we also asked them to name implications for healthcare, which we again qualitatively analyzed and listed and then had the Delphi panelists return and then rank them as you know what's most important to uh, for this, um, as far as an implication for how this evidence should impact care and serious illness and also um, for uh, care of healthy populations. And just zeroing in on the literature regarding um, serious illness, um, there were three, the top three included routinely incorporating spiritual care into the medical care of patients with serious illness, including spiritual care education in the training of all members of the interdisciplinary medical team caring for seriously ill patients, and then including specialty practitioners of spiritual care, um, such as chaplains, in the care of patients with serious illness. So just in summary, this um, is a systematic review of uh, 
the fairly extensive um, literature on spirituality and serious illness and health outcomes, and we've actually extracted out the strongest evidence available in each of those topic areas. Um, we had an expert panel then review that evidence, um, ultimately yielding eight evidence statements supported by, um, deemed supported by strong evidence by our expert Delphi panel, um, both in serious illness, and then there was another eight in, in health outcomes. Um, and then this, uh, we also have our expert panel providing us with the implications of this evidence for the care of patients in serious illness, um, including the importance of including spiritual care in the care of all seriously ill patients, spiritual care education for the healthcare team, and the inclusion of chaplains in the care of the seriously ill. So um, in a moment here, I'll turn it over to, um, uh, to Tammy and to Antonina, but I do just wanna say that this was the work of many people, um, faces and names listed, um, listed here, our Delphi panelists, as well as a, a large research team um, in order to make this whole project possible. So with that, I'm going to go ahead and stop sharing my screen. I hope I did, I'm doing this correctly. Did that you work? Are. <laughs> yep, okay, great. Exactly. And I'll turn it over. I believe, is it Tammy, are you speaking first? Yeah. I just yes, want to say thanks so much, Tracy. Uh, it's an uh, incredible amount of work you and your team did and a wonderful summary of it. Um, uh, Tammy, um, why don't you um, begin by sharing some of your thoughts about this? Yep. Thank you, Tracy, and thank you to the team for all of their incredible work. Um, I just can't um, say enough about the methodology and how intense and rigorous and um, just incredible that we've gotten to this point to have this evidence. So I've had some time to reflect and think about um, the implications of the findings and um, and I know my colleague Antonina will have as well. So I think there are a few key, um, key aspects. So I just want to think about uh, the three key findings. So one is uh, routine incorporation. I'm going to do this without slides, so it might be more fun that way. Uh, so routine incorporation of um, of spiritual care, and I think that the emphasis on the word routine is is very important. Routine to me means every, <laughs> maybe not every, but almost every. Routine means it would be um, something that. If it were missing, we would we would question. And so, um, as we think through that as a quality indicator, um, really, I think um, it, we need to be thinking about this in terms of quality and safety. Um, when we think that something routinely needs to be done, it can can be uh, focused on quality, and uh, we also need to think about um, does this add add patient safety um, aspects to this? Do, is a patient going to uh, feel um, like their their care team um, is is actually caring for them in a in a way that makes them feel that all of their needs are being met, which which I think really focuses um, on the team um, the team's um, uh, detailed nature of caring for a patient. And so um, this concept of how we get to routinely is not a small point in medicine. Uh, typically, routinely in in medicine and the care of serious illness. Uh, illness um, or in any patient would mean that if it's not happening, then then things stop. There are uh, bells and whistles and uh, exclamation points that happen in patients' records, and and air, and care actually can't proceed. And we've done that with a number of things in medica medicine, um, particularly around medications and care processes, uh, so that we don't make uh, mistakes and we don't forget forget things. And right now, that's not really a hard stop in the care of uh, patients with serious illness. And so I think about thinking about what routine might mean and what the implications are in the care pathway of a seriously ill patient means that you cannot pass go, you cannot collect $200, we cannot continue the game unless that actually happens. So I think just thinking about that. So that's the first thing um, that I'd like, like to say um, just as an observation. The second thing is um, in spiritual care education and training um, with all members of the IDT. I think fundamental to thinking about the interdisciplinary team is actually um, who's on the interdisciplinary team. So 
we might think of maybe a palliative care team, or we might think of an oncology team, or we might think of a transplant team. And we need to think about who are all the members um, in the interdisciplinary team. So you could have a pharmacist on the interdisciplinary team, you could have a social worker, you could have a nurse, you could have a medical assistant. There are so many people um, who are on the interdisciplinary team as we think through Im implementation really is defining all the members of the interdisciplinary team. Um, I would say that uh, that environmental services and nutrition um, are nutrition services are actually on the interdisciplinary team. And so sometimes, you know, I, I have had the experience where in the environmental services um, staff who are caring for a patient can tell me more about their pain and symptoms than other people on the team. And so thinking about when we say spiritual care education training, who are we talking about? And is it really just um, kind of the usual suspects that we're looking at? And could we improve our quality if we actually uh, first laid out who's on the team, all the members of the team that interface with this patient to have to to have care happen um, and and what is needed. So volunteers, for instance, do we routinely train our volunteers um, in uh, spiritual care um, assessment and uh, practice? Do we consider that to be something that someone needs to be licensed to do um, or not? And so I really think about spiritual care education um, in, and training as really uh, fun, uh, another fundamental idea where we have to go back to basics, which is who's on the interdisciplinary team, what is the training that is um, the training pathway? So we think of, uh, you know, nurse nurse practitioners, PAs, physicians, uh, for instance, have one clinical training pathway. Um, nurses have another clinical training pathway. Pharmacists have another. And so, where does this fall in that curric curriculum and in organizations? How does that how does that happen when when people come to you? in your organization and they have not been trained, what is your obligation to actually train them um, and how are we gonna do that? Um, so I think the third piece is really around um, having spiritual care practitioners uh, be involved um, in the care. So if we can get to the routine incorporation and then we can get um, our interdisciplinary team trained and we think then through, we have taken care of all the low hanging fruit um, and we're beginning to meet needs um, at some basic level, who actually needs the subspecialty resource um, of a spiritual care practitioner? And what does, what does it look like actually, what does spiritual care look like if you don't have a subspecialty resource of a, of, of a spiritual care practitioner, such as a chaplain? What does that look like um, it, because we're talking about routine and we're talking about the IDT. Um, so we, we actually have to define what that might look like. And then um, if we're going to have a, a spiritual care subspecialist come and, come and interact um, with, our, with our patient because we've determined that that is a, is a need that needs to happen. I think that um, some of the most important aspects there are, are two things. One is resource. <laughs> um, do we, it, this is the same thing that we deal with. Um, I'm a palliative care physician, and so uh, everybody wants some. There's not enough to go around. How does that work? Um, what do you do when you are uh, morally, professionally, and existentially distressed because you can't get there? So um, being able to have resources um, available and then how to deploy those resources are important. The other, the other um, aspect of this that I often think about for those um, participants here who um, are spiritual care subspecialists, um, in other words, chaplains, that's what I like to call, call you because you are a subspecialist um, and a, a specialist and a subspecialist, um, is not all chaplains um, have the same training. <laughs> and so um, you, you, you all um, speaking, speaking to you and as a field um, of spiritual health, thinking about that training pathway and what resource, um, if we are saying that a patient needs to have a spiritual care practitioner, 
what level of training um, does that practitioner need to have? Um, and when is it when is it safe to have um, somebody um, in that role? When would we consider that to be less than? And so that becomes a, a resource discussion. Um, as we think about using the findings, I think to talk about our leader, talk with our leaders and our organizations, I think there are several aspects. One is um, that I think that the, the type of individuals in an organization that should be um, addre addressing this are actually those in charge of quality and safety. Um, if, we, um, if we believe the findings, which there's no reason that we should not believe the findings, um, then we actually have to, uh, this moves into qu routine quality and safety, just like we do many other things in medicine falls, um, making sure we don't uh, give somebody the wrong blood type, those sorts of things. Um, I think that quality and safety is, uh, uh, in individuals in charge of that are the ones that should be the stewards in an organization of making sure this happens. And then um, making sure that, the, that, that there are resources to do this um, of a subspecialty nature and that uh, curricular time is, is actually designated. Um, and so that curricular time gets to be very complicated, right? It can be in people's training pathways, but, but really the reality is, unless you're going to take a 30 year view on this, if you have uh, individuals in your organization caring for patients that have not been trained, there is an obligation to train them. And so how we actually make that happen um, is not a small point. So those are just some of my, my thoughts. Um, so to summarize, thinking about the word routine is strong. That means every or almost every. Spiritual care education and who's, on, who's in the IDT and then resources. So I'm gonna turn it over to my colleague. Thanks, Tammy. Antonina, it's all yours. Thank you so much, Tammy. You raised so many fantastic points, and I'm going to um, take a slightly different approach, uh, just because my first thought in, in reading this article, and actually my first two thoughts were, first of all, how do I socialize this information? Because as Tammy lifted, to consider something routine and to ultimately, um, uh, per her suggestion, to really position this understanding with qual within quality and safety, one first has to socialize the information. And I know that the socialization of spiritual care and the, and the importance of spiritual care integration into primary care and to care of people with serious illness is not something that I can assume within my organization. So my first thought was, how do I socialize this information so that we can follow pathways to create um, and I love that that use of the word routine to create an understanding of the provision of spiritual care as routine care. And my second thought was, how do I ensure that the chaplains providing spiritual care are actually providing what our IDT partners need? And how do I assess that? And then how do I ensure that the chaplains all have the, the capability to provide what our stakeholders tell us we need? So in looking at the educational component of this article, I really thought of two pathways of education. The internal education of our chaplains or our spiritual care resources and the education of the other members of the IDT team and provider stakeholder partners. So starting first with that understanding of how to um, ensure that our chaplains had the resources that they need to provide this care. Um, we did an, an audit that we've been working on, basically of our chaplain's documentation. And in thinking about documentation, we wanted to know, are chaplains truly assessing patients in the way that they should be? And are they able to create plans of care that our stakeholder partners utilize? What we found through our initial audits is that chaplains are trained at very different levels. Uh, Tammy lifted that chaplain training varies. There is a variety, therefore, in the way that they document. And we would say, uh, after looking at our initial assessments, that some chaplains document very well uh, these two key components, assessments and plan of care, and some chaplains don't. 
And when we went back to have an initial discussion with our chaplains, what we found is that chaplains vocalized very clearly that they didn't always feel that they were trained to do this well and that they appreciated and needed an understanding of the type of training that would allow their documentation to rise to the level of strong clinical practice. So um, understanding that, we decided we needed to create a, a universal pathway and understanding of what strong clinical documentation looks like within our organization. Before we wanted to do that, however, we looked at our other piece um, of the IDT team members, meaning what did our stakeholders and partners on the clinical side really want and need from spiritual care documentation? And quite frankly, we started even before that and went upstream and asked our, our IDT partners, do you look at spiritual care documentation? We don't want to make an assumption that every provider walks into the room understanding that there's a spiritual care um, assessment done and that they should review it, we actually asked the question. And what we found was that this varied just as widely as the documentation varied. We had some providers and clinical partners who told us that they always looked at a chaplain note, all the way to a spectrum of people who told us that they didn't even know where to find a spiritual care note within our EHR. Um, we also asked if you were reading the note and if you and if you did look at a, at a spiritual care note, what did you need from that note to help us be strong contributors to the clinical care of patients? And what our stakeholders told us was that they really needed to have a clear understanding of the emotional state of the patient, particularly in regard to their level of spiritual distress. And that they needed to have those key factors that, uh, that another team member might not have gotten to. I love that Tammy said, uh, frequently it is the environmental services people who know more about the patient than not. I completely agree and have seen that throughout my career. But what we realize that chaplains have the ability to bring is that story of the patient. All of those other social determinants of health of the patient that might impact their care. And how could that be clearly communicated in their assessment note so that that became a piece of an understanding for the entire team of how to care for that patient well? So for instance, um, just to use a, a common example, how do you understand why patients routinely come to the emergency uh, department? We asked some of our stakeholders this, and frequently the answer was, well, we think it's this, or we're not sure about that, but they're here. And what we might find as chaplains, for instance, is that they really didn't have a ride to the emergency department. And so they were calling an ambulance every time they needed to have just a routine doctor's appointment, because that was the only way they could get to the hospital. That type of information and that understanding of those social determinants of health that also impact our patients are a strong component that chaplains can bring to an understanding of the treatment of the care of patients. And that became a critical piece of information that our partners wanted to, to understand. So in looking at education again, uh, we, we thought we needed to start with chaplains and we needed to understand, uh, to create a shared understanding of what strong documentation looked like from the perspective of our clinical partners and stakeholders so that everybody working with us saw the value of that continual and routine review of the spiritual care assessment and note. And then we looked at the flip side based on this article. Who and how did we need to create education pathways for our other stakeholders? Tammy spoke a lot about this, and I and I spent a lot of time reviewing in my mind, do we get into nurse residency? Do we get into ground rounds? Do we create lunch and learns? How do we actually start to create these educational pathways for our partners? I think I have uh, more work to do in this arena, but what I realized is that we need to make it clear organizationally that if we have now decided spiritual care needs to be a routine part of care, then the education around the incorporation of spiritual care needs to be a routine part of our educational pathways. And creating that understanding, again, is going to take 
a lift. I can speak only for my own organization, but there's gonna be a lift involved there and it's gonna involve partnership at all levels. So it's gonna involve those of us within spiritual care to start to create opportunities for this understanding. And that can be at the chaplain level in a, in a local hospital, all the way up to our nursing education partners within our organization, as well as create those pathways for our other clinical partners. And I, and I would also say to all of our IDT team members. So how do we extend that education to people we don't normally um, consider within our organizations as needing education, for instance, those environmental service partners, those nutrition ser service partners. So that's one piece. Um, the other piece that I really uh, thought about was how do we socialize this information? Because I don't want to assume, in fact, I know that I cannot assume that this article be, will be one that is well socialized and understood. So the other component of the work that I saw behind this was, was truly investing in a comprehensive plan of socialization throughout uh, my, my organization. So that, that has to run through all levels of, of our company and that has to involve numerous participants. So from my level, I immediately took this article and began socializing it with all of my component and partner executives. Right? So knowing that my team understood the, these findings, that they were important, socializing it with our partner um, um, executives at our level, and then creating a comprehensive plan of communication with my marketing partners. And that is going to extend, and this is still ongoing. This article, as we said, it, had, it was published about six weeks ago. So uh, this is all still a work in progress, I will admit. But we are looking at every aspect of communication internally within our internal newsletters, our internal um, websites and articles, and how do we show up in clinical spaces and present this information? Who are our partners to present this information? Um, I, would, I would argue that it is literally everyone within the organization almost. So how do we uh, create partnerships so that we can socialize this further? And does that mean just going to our clinical care teams? Um, or does it mean truly trying to socialize this information across our organization with everyone? And finally, uh, a look at resources. Uh, Tammy raised this, I think this is critical. I think um, most of us will agree that I could argue for resources and never feel as if I have enough. There is always a scarcity of, of resource. So how do I start to look at both my, my professional practitioners of spiritual care, so all of my chaplains, and the potential for those spiritual care extenders? So how do we actually invest in some of our partnerships that include people who aren't practitioners, aren't chaplains necessarily, but do have the possibility of being extenders of care? So creating those opportunity for spiritual care companion programs, creating opportunities for spiritual care extender programs, educating um, all of our clinicians, particularly our nurses, who are the bulk of our associates within my organization, about the ways that they can identify signs of spiritual distress, that they can be that first step spiritual care extender for our teams, um, to allow us to identify and incorporate the provision of spiritual care more broadly. And then really looking at the resources that we have within our professional body of chaplains and deploying them where we see the greatest impact. So does that mean we really start looking at serious illness and ensuring that there is always a spiritual care component to the teams that are involved with, spiritual, with, with serious illness? Does that mean we need to go to our quality and safety partners and help identify from a risk perspective where's the, the real impact of not including spiritual care in some of these places? And starting to raise that level of discussion around quality and safety so that we are certain that the organization understands the need to incorporate spiritual care more fully. So I would say, and George, I see you, which means I'm talking enough and I need to and I need to pull back. So I will. 
But I will say that that this is a work in progress that's going to take all of us within healthcare to socialize, and that based on the evidence in this outstanding paper, for which I am I'm so grateful, um, it is also incumbent upon us to have these conversations within our organization to ensure that this understanding is socialized throughout our care of all of our patients. Thank you, Antonina. I, you know, part of what I hear uh, with Antonina and Tammy actually is that on the one hand, uh, uh, the team that Tracy pulled together did this incredible job of synthesizing information, getting some experts to uh, evaluate it and to uh, give us uh, the uh, key implications. But the dissemination side of this, right, is like, oh my gosh, that's not a small piece. But Tracy, uh, let me bring you back in actually. Um, you know, thoughts that you have about how spiritual care leaders should be disseminating the information in their organization or things that you heard from Tammy or Antonina um, that you want to respond to. Uh, uh, let me turn it to you. Sure. No, I mean, these are, well, I think I was kind of hearing in both um, Tammy and Antonina, your um, comments, how, you know, there's like this, this component that's okay, taking this information and figuring out, okay, well, what should this, what should, what, how can this be standardized? Like, um, what should this actually look like? Um, what does routine mean? Um, what does training mean, both for chaplains and for um, the rest of the interdisciplinary team and then who is that team um and uh, i do i do wonder um and this kind of gets also to antonina's thoughts on socialization if um if if there are ways to then you know take this information and begin to hash out what those what those criteria should be um in each of those you know just use the three there's obviously a lot more that needs to be done but you have to start somewhere and those are probably the three most important um and then begin to go to organizations that uh, you know i guess you start with things like quality and safety in your own institution but really what this needs to be is institutions need to be held accountable to it so they need criteria to follow and then it needs to go do everything from jaco okay jaco we have this is we have this JAMA paper. This is the implications of this this evidence. This is what this should look like. This is how you should be evaluating institutions on spiritual care. Like there should be a a way that this now informs how institutions are evaluated. Or you know, U.S. News and News and World Report. Do they include spiritual care? Or you know, when they evaluate institutions, you know, we have the best of this, that, da 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 you know, they should be using, you know, so you, so we need those, what those criteria should be. And then we need to go to those kind of accountability. I mean, yes, accountability within our own institutions, I think that's a good place to start, but then ultimately it's really gonna need to go the next step, which is how institutions are held accountable um, to excellence in care. And we didn't talk about the, the healthy populations data, but this is as much about healthy populations as it as it is about serious illness so this is something that organizations really should care about and those holding organizations accountable should care about yeah tammy go ahead yeah so so tracy thank you for that and um i was thinking as you were saying that as we think through cms quality indicators uh pay, pay for, for pay for performance um certainly it, it brings into question, if we're looking to have the best outcome for a patient, and this is really important, <laughs> then how do we um, add to that accountability step um, with respect to, to NADA? It would be really nice if um, this were routine, but if, if this is not routine in your organization, then not doing that there, there is some accountability to that. Um, and so we often like to get to get places um, with carrots versus sticks. However, um, much of the behemoth uh, medical machine with all the priorities um, that it's facing, um, that, is, that is certainly an attention getter. And I would say that if we get to things like QHIP and CMS, that those are gonna be the things that are going to really um change organizations and we we wish 
I, I wish that, that, that those were not the drivers that changed organizations. Uh, realistically, those are often the drivers that change organizations. So thank you for, for bringing it at that level. So um, Tammy, I would echo that. And I would add that as we look at just the changing healthcare landscape in general, and the focus on value-based um, care, the focus on moving wellness upstream and an understanding of health in general upstream, that understanding that, the, that addressing spirituality needs to be a key component, needs to be embedded all the way upstream in our understanding of how do we start treating populations um, in their totality, right? As we would express it, providing that truly holistic care, mind, body, and, and, and spirit that starts while they're still well. And I would echo Tammy's that there's, there's a component of carrot versus stick we might want, not want to acknowledge, but the truth is there are a lot of competing priorities within healthcare. And if there's not an accountability metric, as we say, it doesn't get paid attention to. So I like that, that understanding of putting this on a, as a quality and safety measure because then it will be attended to. And that's one of the only ways that it, that it will be. And, and that's just a reality based on all of the competing priorities that we have. I also think creating understanding within some of our critical partners, such as CMS, so the Center for Medicare and Medicaid, um, is moving towards an understanding of, of, clinical, um, of the clinical value of spirituality. But moving some of those large organizations and socializing this information with those critical healthcare partners um, is going to be one of the things that is going to fall uh, to the level of necessity, our immediate necessity, so that we can start to not just hold ourselves accountable, but be held accountable. This is a, a piece of the conversation that I actually hadn't uh, expected. Um, uh, out of this, I mean, the whole part of dissemination, but then the whole um, the thinking about what does this mean for actually creating criteria for evaluating uh, adherence to these recommendations at kind of the level of, of national organizations. This is um, a, a really uh, um, important conversation to continue, and I've just had a few thoughts about that, and you know, making notes to myself about emailing all of you to get us back together again to think about how we can how we can take that for the next step. But in, in the last few minutes, if we, we kind of move from the kind of national transformation around criteria for adherence here that are implied by the study, if, if we just take it um, down to the level of the local organization for a minute, I wonder as in the last few minutes, if each of you might say, if I'm the chaplain manager who's gotten this article and I've come to understand it, who are the first two people in my organization that I should be talking to about it? Does that question make sense? Anybody yeah. want to take a, take a I, shot at that? I would say that um, the, the people that care about it the most who are taking care of seriously ill patients. So um, I would be I would be finding my my members of my spiritual um, care team that are most engaged in the care of serious illness of patients of serious illness in critical care and oncology um, and transplant environments in particular. Um, and I think that um, having, having those folks be in the know is gonna be critical. If you have enough critical mass to have that many folks, um, I, I think that's gonna be, be that. And taking it to your care teams, uh, the palliative care team, the critical care team, those leaders, um, where seriously ill patients, your your oncology team, the, those seriously those those uh, folks that are responsible for the care of seriously ill patients every single day um, should be the lowest hanging fruit. Thanks, Tammy. Antonina, Tracy, either of you. I would agree with that. Um, in the way my organization is is organized, we actually have service line leaders. So I think that understanding uh, the creation of that understanding with a service line leader, such as the leader of our oncology service line would be critical. I also think that you have within every local hospital key identified clinical leaders, particularly nurse managers. And I think an understanding at that local level with the nurse management um, team who can then disseminate that further to their to their nurses and clinical partners 
would be another key stakeholder that chaplains could engage in immediately at the local level. Thanks. Tracy, last words. We're coming down to the top of the hour. No, I, I agree with that as far as Tammy and Antonina kind of naming, you know, I think the key people that are involved in serious illness care, um, you know, key leaders of 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 those groups. Um, I mean, I maybe I'd take it up a little further and just say to go to the C-suite, especially, you know, head of you know, head of your nursing, the head of your patient experience, and um, you know, that would be an additional place to go, but probably the most kind of on the ground um, would be finding ways in which to talk about this, whether it's in grand rounds or um, to begin to bring it up into people's minds. But then I think also um, even sending sending papers, sending information uh, to those in leadership is, is also key to hopefully begin to catch their um, hearts and minds. I think there's more and more receptivity. I think some of this, because of the research that's already been there, there's more and more receptivity to understanding that this is actually really important for their patients. Yeah. Let, let me just say, I, I, you know, to the chaplains who are kind of listening, I'm not sure how many of you have had the experience of giving a research article to a clinical colleague or a clinical leader and saying there's some important new research that's actually related to your work and my work, and I'd like to discuss it with you. But this is really a great example, if you haven't done that before, that your clinical leaders will be glad to know about this. They may or may not have bumped into it. It may not have been brought to their attention by other people. And so for you to take initiative, actually, um, uh, to say, um, uh, you know, this is something we all need to know about and have a chance to discuss with each other. So the dissemination work uh, can actually, um, you know, begin at a very local level and then, the, you know, we'll continue it at other levels. And if you need education and help in terms of understanding the article and thinking about how to disseminate it, send us some emails. We'll think about other webinars to help you be able to grasp this article and think about how to disseminate it. But for today, let me just say, oh my gosh, Tracy, uh, uh, Tammy, Antonina, so grateful for you uh, spending time with us to help us understand what really is probably um, one of the most important things that's been published about spiritual care and healthcare um, in the last 20 years. And uh, we're really glad to begin this conversation with you and appreciate your time and your expertise. Take care, friends. Uh, we look forward to staying in touch. Bye, Bye everyone. Thank you. Thanks, everybody. Bye, thank you.